Another day of Roman rule. The promise of a Messiah seemed further away than it had ever been. Moses split the sea and saved the nation. Elijah condemned idols and called down fire. David led the kingdom into glory. These were the leaders they longed for. The carpenter from Nazareth didn't look like a king. His wood-worn hands and dusty clothes were those of a servant. He healed the sick, raised the dead, fed the masses. He blessed the children, ate with outcasts, and forgave sins. He came to minister, yet he suffered and was rejected. Jesus Christ, King of Kings, was crowned with thorns and nailed to a cross. He gave his life as a ransom. Truly, this man was the Son of God. He is our servant king.
people. I know you're not supposed to talk about this stuff at youth services and make this a big deal. I just think we can see miracles at a youth camp. I just think the Lord can show his mighty arm in this place this week. I think if you walked in here with cancer, you can walk out of here without it. means five minutes and I promise it'll be less than that I want you to hear me for a couple moments numbers 13 we find that Joshua sends the spies into the promised land God has already given them the promise of the promised land but they had yet to achieve it so here's Joshua sending these spies in their word their job really was to confirm the word not to give their opinion And so Joshua sends these 12 spies in. He says, and they came into the brook of Eshel. This is the promised land. This is the place where everything's happening. And so they came to the brook of Eshel and cut down thence a branch, one cluster of grapes. Everyone say, one cluster. Say, it was just the taste. And they bear it, and they put it on a staff, and they brought the pomegranates of the figs. And the place was called the brook Eshel because the cluster of grapes with the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching the land 40 days. And when they came to the boss, when they came to the man of God, when they came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel and to the wilderness of Paradon, they brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them this is the fruit of that land. This is what, this is just a small taste of what God has promised us. Can I tell you today that this is just a small taste of what God has for the youth of Ohio. So they say, hey, this is just, this is just a little bit. And they told them and said, We came unto the land, whether thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. Surely it's got everything that we need. It's perfect. It's awesome. But then the negative people show up. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. You see, they heard the promise, but they doubted the process. And there's cities that are walled, and they're very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. What that means is they're saying we saw giants there, and we saw Amalekites, and they dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and they started naming all the ites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites, and all these different people, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea. And we just, we just got a big problem because I know God's given us the promise, but, but we don't know how we could ever achieve it. I'll say it this way. I know God has promised us our schools, but I just don't see how it could happen. I, I, I know God's promised to save my family, but it just looks too impossible right now. I, I know God's promised to do some great things in my life, but it just doesn't look like it could happen. But here's my prayer for the youth of Ohio over the next few months. That we would be a Caleb generation. In verse 30 that says, And Caleb stilled the people before Moses. What that basically means is Caleb Caleb told them to be quiet. He said, If you want to speak negative, keep that stuff to yourself. But we... He looked at Moses and he said, I don't have all the answers. I don't know how everything's going to happen. But we've got a promise. And if we've got a promise, I'm not worried about the process. If we've got a promise, we've got everything that we need for 
for we are well able to overcome I've come to tell you right now the drug problem in your city might look like it's too much but you are well able your community might not look like it can be saved but you are well able I know it doesn't look like much I know your youth group doesn't look like much I know there might be more of them than you are you of the, there are of you but you are well able I wish I had a young person that would look at your neighbor and tell him you are well able. Tell him you're well able. You see the spies, this is the last thing I'm gonna say. The spies were content to just go in and get a little taste. They were content just to go to church and have a good experience and go home. But I've come to tell some young people in this room right now, we got to make a declaration. I'm not interested in a taste. I'm not interested in a harvest. I'm interested in the whole field. You got to realize, young person, when you walk into that school, you're not walking in there by yourself. When you walk into your community, you're not walking in there by yourself. You are well able. You are well able. You are well able. Clap your hands and give the Lord some praise as we go into our worship. Come on, let's sustain that worship all over this place. Lift your hands towards heaven. How many believe he's still moving? He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. We declare it in this place. He's still moving. Woo! He's still proving just how great he is.
for a brand new demonstration of your power. We want more than stories. We're declaring and believing for it. So you can welcome here. Anything can happen. Anything can happen. Anything can happen. The moment that you walk in, anything can happen.
anything can happen. Why don't you clap your hands and love the Lord? Amen. Amen. Wow, what a wonderful presence of the Lord that we feel here this week. Why don't you return to your seats and remain standing? While you're on your way back, why don't we give this worship team a huge shout out? Some of my lifelong friends on that, on that worship team and love them very much, doing a tremendous job. Thank you. Let's give a big shout out to Sister Calix for doing such a great job leading us in worship. Amen. Please remain standing if you can. Don't rush or anything. We're just waiting on you. It's easy. Well, how have you enjoyed Ohio Youth Summer Retreat so far? Good. Very good. I'm so glad that you've enjoyed it. Thank you for making your way out to the house of the Lord tonight. Uh, students, why don't we give all of our parents, pastors, and youth workers that are here tonight give a, a big hand. Amen. Thank you for being here. As you see, uh, we are at full capacity. And so if you are watching online, uh, it is we will have two overflow rooms. Uh, we just can't physically fit another person in this room. We're going to do our best, but uh, we are at max capacity. And uh, But God likes full things, and this is a full house. 375 campers or so, and so we're so grateful for them. A few years... This loud, rambunctious, kind of annoying guy came into my life. Maybe a lot annoying guy. Uh, but Brother Huckabee uh, is our speaker tonight, or this week. And he came into my wife and I's life at a very pivotal point in our life and in our ministry. And really... I could probably look back and say there are about two or three periods in my life where the Lord really challenged me and uh, helped develop me as a leader. I'm still not all the way there. Uh, he knows that. But there are people that have shaped me. And outside of my pastor, Brother Carson, there's been no other person that has shaped my ministry uh, and shaped our lives, my wife and I's life. As much as Brother Jason Huckabee and his amazing wife and uh, their wonderful kids. And I want you to know that you are in for a treat tonight. And he is a little crazy, so you're going to have to listen. Whatever he says after this point, after I step down, you cannot hold the Ohio District Youth accountable for that, okay? And we become good friends. This is the kind of um, friendship that we have. My first daughter was born. And Huck sent me a message, and we got some beautiful flowers in the mail. And it said, congratulations on the birth of Emerson Ray. Nat and I love you very much. Parentheses, at least she has one good-looking parent. Love, Jason and Natalie Huckabee. And if that's not a Huck quote, I, I, yeah, I, maybe Natalie wrote that. But, uh, but, uh, but Brother Huckabee is one of my dearest friends and an elder in my life. I don't know where I'd be without him. And could we welcome him to Ohio as he come and preaches the word? Let's give him a big Ohio welcome. Well, praise the Lord, Ohio. Amen. It is a delight to be here. I count it a high honor and privilege uh, to stand in this pulpit and I look across this wonderful congregation and see so many wonderful friends that we have made through the years uh, as we have uh, worked through the Ohio district to some degree and just a delight uh, to stand in this pulpit and I would certainly be remiss not to give a, just a huge shout out to our Anchor Church family that's probably in this room somewhere. We love the Anchor Church in Zanesville. Amen. I will reserve my comments uh, about that later, maybe, but uh, just a joy to be here and 
Uh, I also saw Brother Tom Ellis, whom I love very much. Uh, amen. Former youth president, longtime friend. I don't know if his wife is here. Is Kristen in the room? I, I don't see her. She probably would not shout if, uh, if she is in the room. But uh, there's a wonderful story about her dancing in the living room of her home while I was on my way to preach at Calvary. And she fell and uh, limped all weekend long. And so she can just limp right into the presence of the Lord. If you see her, greet her. I see her coming in the back back there. Uh, we hope she doesn't fall on her way to her seat. Amen. But it is good to be in Ohio among friends. Did our day speaker not do a tremendous job this morning? Amen. I love Jerry West, this youth team, your youth president, uh, really more his wife than your youth president, just tremendous people, gifted and used of the Lord, and I am so grateful for their friendship. And then there's a picture I think they have, I'll just do this right now before I read my text, and this is my family, I don't know if they have a picture, I sent it this afternoon, um, that's not it that so that's team Huckabee that's me Natalie Mallory Rhett and Knox and they're all with me here for camp today and I honor them I'm thankful my family's with me amen if you have your Bibles the book of St. Mark chapter 1 is where I'll read my text St. Mark chapter 1 and verse number 6 and John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of his skin about his loins. And he did eat locust and wild honey and preach saying, there cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in the Jordan and straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan and was with the wild beast and the angels ministered unto him. Verse 12. The Bible said, and immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. If I could just for effect walk you through the moments that brings Jesus to verse number 12. He's baptized of John in the Jordan. And the Spirit speaks an affirming word to Christ. This is Him. Now it doesn't come more declarative. And when the Spirit speaks out of heaven with anointing and says, this is my beloved son this is the Messiah this is Christ in whom I am well pleased I'm going to tell you some of us would have walked out of those waters with our chest in the air feeling so accomplished and empowered and the very next phrase is and immediately the Spirit. I feel a little word for somebody in this room. The crisis and the challenge that you're facing may not be your enemy, but it could be the Spirit that is driving you into your wilderness so that you can step into your destiny.
even Jesus had to go through a desert. And the Bible says that he learned his identity from those things he was subjected to. Can I help somebody in this room? The Holy Ghost is going to take you places that you would not otherwise go. Mm, I feel a little help in this house. Brother Nutter, I don't like the desert. I don't like the heat. I don't like the arid climate. I don't like the crisis moments. I don't like it when the enemy speaks those words that are counterintuitive to the direction that my flesh wants to lead me. I hate those moments. I hate loneliness. But the Spirit drove Jesus into his destiny the Lord will help me for just a few minutes I want to preach on this subject driven by the spirit driven by the spirit would you put your hands in the air and why don't you invite the Lord to speak all over this congregation tonight Lord we love you we thank you for your word God, would you put your hands together and bless the Lord? God bless you as you're seated. Jesus, the Messiah, who was in all ways tempted as we are yet without sin. It's this particular verse that lends us to the idea that Christ approached this showdown with Satan Perhaps with a choice. The choice to choose his sinless messiahship or opt for possibly a lesser life sentence. Death was inevitable, but its prolonging and change in methodology had to appeal to the flesh of Jesus Christ. However, it is in our text that the Bible writes, the spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. Can I just make this parenthetical statement in my comments tonight that the Spirit should be the driving force in each of our lives. The Spirit should be the driving force in each of our lives. I don't believe that the Spirit is something that we receive to use as some kind of marginal empowerment for the things that we want. But the Spirit is something that should drive the very essence of our existence. There ought to be a desire an innate desire within the heart of every youth and young adult in this room that we should desire to please the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit, that our steps should be ordered by the Spirit. In fact, it's in St. John chapter 16, verse 13. The Bible said, And when the Spirit of truth is come, that it will lead and guide you into all truth. I'm not going to preach a message here on principles perhaps or even holiness, but can I tell you that there are a whole lot of things that your pastor should not have to preach about or even relegate or in some way even teach to the degree that he has to within our churches if we would be led by the Spirit. The Holy Ghost is the greatest teacher that we have in our life. Let me help you. Somebody shouldn't have to tell you that you don't belong in fellowship with that group of people that you're associating with. You ought to have enough Holy Ghost in you 
that when you step into that forum, something begins to move on the inside of you that creates a boundary in the spirit. Not because pastor said it, not because mom mandated it, not because dad declared it, but because the Holy Ghost said, because you are filled with the spirit. There is a difference between being born and walking in relationship. Some talk perhaps about the hypocrisy that we find even within the context of apostolic fellowship. But the truth is the explanation for much of that is because we have decreed and declared that being born of the Spirit is how we get our direction. That being born of the Spirit, Brother Nutter, is why I live the way I live. The truth is we have too many people that are born of the Spirit but do not walk in the Spirit. Being born doesn't make you a son. Fellowship makes you a son. Being born as the byproduct of a biological donor does not give you sonship. But when you walk in the identity of your father, it puts in you an authority that you do not otherwise have. And when I walk with my dad and I sound like my dad and I act like my dad and I walk in fellowship with the father, then all of a sudden sonship and all the gifts that come with sonship are the byproduct of relationship. Brother Ellis, he said those that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. I'm going to tell you why I belong to God. is because I walk as the Spirit directs me. Mm, I wish I had a little help in this room. There are some of you that are living on one tongue talking experience. And it has been the thing that has guided the maturity that you have lived in unto this point. But the Lord sent me to remind somebody in this room that just because you were birthed in the spirit does not mean that you are living in the spirit. We can be born in the Holy Ghost. But what would happen in this atmosphere tonight if somebody would embrace their identity as the Son of God? He's my dad. And because he's my dad, I have authority over cancer. I have authority over diabetes. I have authority over sin, disease, and sickness. I feel like preaching in this room. There are miracles in this house. But it comes to those who are led by the Spirit. I hate the desert. Hate it. I mean, it's like 78 degrees outside and I'm still sweating. I wasn't built for the desert. I was built. I grew up in the south, as you can tell by my vernacular. And it's hot all the time. And I moved to the north, bro, west. And from about October to June, my feet never get warm. It snows, it's cold. I bought a coat when I lived in Memphis and didn't wear it for 11 years. Now I wear it about 11 times a day. I realized very quickly when I lived in the South that I really wasn't built for the heat. And then I moved to the North and found out that I wasn't built for the cold. 
and I realized that I was really built for comfort. I don't like deserts. They're hot, they're arid. They are extreme. Not only is the climate to some degree the presenter of a number of challenges. And I don't like the fact that it's so sparsely populated. I like people. I like to talk. In fact, if we're talking, I'm probably the one talking. You're most likely listening. I didn't ask you, Brother Nutter. One amen all night from right here, and it's that. I don't like it. And I just imagine that Jesus is baptized in the Jordan. He is affirmed by the Spirit. The Bible says in the same text, and the Spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. Into the wilderness where there are no words of affirmation. Into the wilderness where every insecurity that you have seems to come to the forefront of your spiritual existence. No, Jesus doesn't have someone standing there patting him on the back going, Jesus, you're going to make it through this trial. Jesus, you're going to make it through this. I know that it seems lonely right now and I know that the struggle is great and I know that you are affirmed by the Spirit out there but you're suffering through the loneliness of this crisis moment that you're in. But I just want to tell you, you're going to get through it and when you come out on the other side, you're going to be better than you were when you came in. But it doesn't happen that way. Jesus, in his loneliness, is fasting. Oh yeah, he ain't even eating. There's no one to affirm him. It's hot to even qualify as a desert, according to geographical formations, means that it has to have less than 10 inches of rain per year. It's dry, it's arid, it's parched, he's hungry, there's no affirming voices in his life, and wouldn't you know it, right in the middle of that atmosphere, the devil shows up. I hate the devil. Because the devil don't show up when you're in the middle of the throes of Wednesday night at camp meeting. He doesn't show up when when they're clicking on all cylinders and the floor is shaking and the rafters are rocking and the Holy Ghost is moving and folks are being touched by the presence of the Lord. That's not when the devil shows up. The devil waits till you're alone and you're struggling through an isolated moment and you're having some some inward view of yourself about what you will never accomplish and what you might never be in your identity crisis and you're alone and weary and dry and parched and it's been a long time since you felt the rain of the spirit and then the enemy shows up and here's what he said, you're not who you say you are. not who you said you were Jesus truth is that sometimes the devil can talk so loud that it can make the experience from a season of go be drowned out in the identity crisis he tries to sow into your spirit Can I say it this way? Is it possible that even Jesus is vulnerable? You're not who you say you are. You're really not the Christ. 
If you were, then you'd turn those stones into bread. If you were, then you would cast yourself down from the temple and you'd let the angels catch you before you hit the bottom. If you really were God, you would do things the way that I'm saying that you ought to do them. Can I help somebody right here? What the enemy was trying to sow into the Christ is the possibility of circumventing the, the process that Jesus was required to walk through to become the Messiah. Let me tell you what the enemy will always do. He'll show up with an opportunity to circumvent God's process. You don't have to go through that. You don't have to listen to your pastor. You don't have to live those principles. You don't have to do all of those things. Let me tell you, there is another way. What the enemy, Brother Nutter, was saying to Jesus is, I'm going to give you an opportunity to circumvent the cross. Woo! I wish I had a little help in this house. How many of you, the enemy, showed up in the darkness of your isolation when it's been a while since you felt the reins of the Spirit and he said, here's an opportunity for you that you can circumvent Calvary, that you don't have to die to yourself, that you don't have to live under subjection to the authority of the Spirit. You can walk after the desires of your humanity. Jesus is in the desert and the enemy begins to offer the opportunity to circumvent dying. I'm not going to preach on this a long time. I'm going to preach you happy, so just stay with me. But we live in a generation that is looking to circumvent dying. I had, a, I had a meeting with some of our hyphens and young adults in our church. I won't go into all the details of the meeting, but I said, why are we dealing with this right now in this generation? And one of the girls raised her hand. She said, oh, that's easy. She said, because we are in a generation that never says no to themselves. We live in a generation that cannot say no to themselves. And so when Jesus said, oh, you want that ministry that you are asking me for in the altar? Oh, by the way, let me show you the cross. And we say, oh, no, 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 Lord, I want that platform, but I don't want to die. I want that church, but I don't want to die. I want that identity, but I don't want to die. Can I help somebody in this room? I have never expended one drop of anointing that I didn't have to go to the cross to pay for. Woo! You look at all of these wonderful ministries that stand in front of you and preach the gospel and propagate anointing and they've been through hell and they fought through struggle and they died in deserts and they've attached themselves to Calvary and the byproduct of it is spiritual authority. I was preaching in Nashville a couple of years ago and a guy I'd known most of my life came out of the crowd and he walked up and stood in the audience. When I got through preaching, he called me over and I hugged him. He said, Huck? He said, man, he said, you, you've always been a decent little preacher. Now you know not to listen to stuff like that because I ain't ever been a little preacher ever. I was born 6'1", 180. <laughs> and ain't seen it in a long time. He said, you've always been a pretty good little preacher. He said, but there's a little something on you now that didn't used to be on you. What is it? I said, hell. He said, what? I said, hell. 
I said, you know all those rough edges that you have? I said, you don't file them off. You burn them off. And I said, you go through enough fire and enough hell and the crushing will produce anointing that will withstand the test of the enemy. Let me tell somebody what's going to get you through to your destiny is the desert. What's going to get you through to that very powerful anointing that you're seeking God for is that moment of isolation, the identity crisis, the desire to give up and throw in the towel. But right at the brink of exhaustion, the Spirit will lead you into your destiny. The Bible says this. Jesus stepped out of the desert. You ready for this? His very first words, post-desert, is found in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it to the minister and sat down. And all the eyes of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Jesus said, I've just been through hell. Jesus said, I was just isolated in the desert. You're not going to believe this, but it was arid and it was parched and it didn't rain while I was there and the enemy showed up and offered me the opportunity to circumvent Calvary and when I came out, when I came out, he said, the spirit of the Lord is on me. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he hath anointed me. The Spirit of the Lord is on. How'd you get the Spirit of the Lord on you, Messiah? Because I went through the desert. Because I had opportunity offered to me to circumvent Calvary. How'd you get that anointing so that blind eyes could be opened? Signs, wonders, and miracles could follow your ministry. You could walk the shores of Gadara and cast out devils. You could call disciples out of Nazareth because I went through something that prepared me for this moment this day this day is the scripture fulfilled in my ears that word that phrase transliterated Jesus said, I have jurisdiction. Brother Ellis, that word jurisdiction means the rights that are granted by the speaking of the law. Brother West, I got some rights because I'm a son that's been led by the Spirit. And the Spirit drove me into a wilderness. And the Spirit led me out of the wilderness. And the Spirit that drove me in is the same Spirit that led me out. And that same Spirit's driving me into my destiny. And as a result of being led by the Spirit, I got some rights that are granted by the speaking of the law. Some of you students in this room tonight need to recognize who you are and what authority you exist under. You know what that means? Open your mouth. That means open your mouth. That means open your mouth. Let me help you. 
Ephesians chapter 4 verse 27 says this. Neither give place to the devil. I'm going to tell you. When I read the transliterated modern text, I thought I was going to run around the room. You know it's good if I run around the room. (laughs) Ephesians 4.27, when he said, neither give place to the devil, it literally means run the devil off. It don't mean don't let him in. It just means run him off from where he is right now. I wish somebody in this room would get a little warlike spirit in you and said, I'm led by the spirit. The spirit brought me to where I am right now. I'm not here by accident. I didn't go to the desert by accident. I didn't come out by accident. I didn't make it to where I am right now by accident. And if I got here led by the Spirit, that means by virtue of sonship, I've got some authority on me that gives me the right to open my mouth and run the devil off. Some of you need to run the enemy out of your youth group. You need to run him out of your choir. You need to run him out of your fellowship circle. You need to run him out of your home. You need to run him out of your family. Run him out of your relationship. Run the devil off. Let me, let, me, let me introduce you to a little word that our generation has lost sight of. You ready for this? No. 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 You see, we step to the table to make some kind of treaty with our enemy. And you don't negotiate with terrorists. Because he'll walk into your house and take everything you will let him have. He will take your peace. He'll take your mind. He will rob your thoughts. He'll cause you to live under the burden of anxiety. He'll cause you to cower in fear. Some of you need to stand on your feet and say no. You can't have you can't have my mind. You can't have my peace. You can't have my spirit. You can't have my youth group. You can't have my church. You can't have my they may not be saved right now, but that don't mean you can have them. Because greater is he that's within you than he that's in the world. David said it like this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I'm almost done. You know what that means? Nothing. (laughs) Bible said David. David walks out to the battlefield at Elah. And he looks into a field that is arrayed and set for battle. And the Philistines are encamped on one side. And Israel is encamped on the other. Forty days. Send me out a man to do battle. He has mocked. He has belittled. He has made them feel beneath what the mission is that God has anointed them for. And if he can ever get you to thinking that you're less... right then what God's purpose is for you, then he can steal the entire city of Washington, D.C. If he can get you to believe him, 
that you can never accomplish what you're called for, then you'll give up and throw in the towel and let the enemy have something that he will not ever have to war after. But he knows that if he has to go to war, he cannot win. Yes, yes, yes. I'm telling somebody in this room that the reason that the enemy's trying to go to war with you is because he knows if you ever take out the sword and get in the middle of the battle that he cannot win. If he ever gets you to understand how anointed you are for the school hall that you walk through, he cannot win. My little girl's here. She's 13. We took a little church in Kansas City. I'm just going to be honest with you. I can't even tell you how much stuff we walked through. We called a church in St. Louis. Said, we don't have anybody our daughter's age at church. Is there any way that she can go to youth camp with you? Sure. She went to youth camp with them. For a while. And my wife said, babe, suck it up, buttercup. Not everybody has a youth group of 30. You know what that means? You got to win them. Yeah. Sorry about your luck. Start winning souls. My little girl, 13. She's younger than that. Then when she starts fifth grade, she starts calling up all her friends. Hey, you want to come to Bible club on Wednesday night with me? No, probably not. One or two here or there. Sixth grade. They say, yeah, we might come with you, Mallory. My wife starts running a little route over there picking them up. She'll show up with a few here and there. Seventh grade. She calls me one night. Dad, we got a problem. I said, what is it? We got more kids and we got room in the, in the car. You think we could borrow the church van? I said, baby, well, you can't now just borrow the church van. I'll come drive it. I picked up a whole bus load of kids. All, hear me. All kids that my little girl who has nobody to go to church camp with that the Spirit led her into the desert, the Spirit led her out of the desert, and the Spirit gave her vision for a destiny. She started knocking on their doors, inviting them to church. I'll just skip ahead in the story. 14 of them have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking with tongues. And I baptized some of them in Jesus' name. Can I tell somebody in this room that the reason that the enemy is after your mind is because he knows if you're willing to fight, he can't win. I got one more point. Man, I could go all night. Go ahead. Go ahead. That's why we're here. Go ahead. David looks out over Eli and his brother. I can't preach this because I don't have time. His okay. brother said, You can't do it. Can I just tell you that the defeat of Goliath? was a foregone conclusion. Right. Right. The navigating around the negativity of his brother was what he had to first overcome yeah. to get to his destiny. He looks out over Eli. And this is what the Bible said. The Bible said for Goliath had come up. In other words, Goliath had gone so unconfronted for so long that now he was making his way into their camp. Run the devil. 
devil off. Watch what he does. Anybody have any idea why all those men are fearful? David's got a little spirit of recognition on him that's not on everybody else. Because David never asked if God will give him victory. David's like, what's a king going to do? How pretty is a girl I'm about to get? <laughs> she better be fine because this giant's going down. <laughs> How much money the king going to give? What's going to be fed at the king's table? Because the giant, his death is a foregone conclusion. It's a done deal. I'm not worried about the giant. I just got to get past a brother who don't believe I can do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if I can ever get by Eliab, yeah. if I can ever get by, if I can ever get by my brother, and I know that the giant's a done deal because God will do battle with the enemy. Yeah. Hear me, and I'm done. The Bible said that Goliath was a champion. You know why he was a champion? Y'all ready for this? This is deep. Because he wins. Goliath was a champion because he won in those battles. And all of those members of that nation that was fearful of the outcome of the battle were fearful because generations before them had fallen prey to that giant. I just, I just got this little feeling that while they're up there, Brother Nutter, looking down in the valley, the reason they're so intimidated is because one of them looks at his brother and he goes, isn't that the same champion that took out our dad? Hold on. That giant's been around so long. Isn't that the giant that took out our grandfather? You, 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 you remember Uncle Billy? He got assassinated by that giant. And he's come for us too. And generation after generation after generation has made him a champion. I wish somebody in this room would hear me. How many of you have looked down the aisle into the valley and said, my mother was an addict and my grandmother was an addict and my aunt, she suffered with addiction and my dad, he was an alcoholic and his dad was an alcoholic and his dad before him was an alcoholic and, and he suffered with adultery and, and then he suffered with adultery and the generation before them suffered with adultery and David said, hold on. Come on. Yeah. The curse ends right here. Yeah. No. No. I won't be an alcoholic my daddy may have died an alcoholic but I'm going to die a free man because I was born in the spirit I was led by the spirit and I am a son of the spirit and because of that I have the anointing on me to break a generational curse No, I don't care too who cheated. I don't care how long they cheated and I don't care who they cheated with. Your generation can have deliverance over immorality. No. You ready and I'm done. You say, Pastor, how do you say no? I'll tell you, those who are the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. I got to be led of the Spirit. I got to be led of the Spirit. It'll lead me across the Red Sea. It'll lead me around the mountain. It'll lead me across the Jordan. It'll give me houses I didn't build and vineyards I didn't plant. The Spirit...
driven by the Spirit. Tell you what will grow your church. Not just a bunch of clapping and noise. Somebody who gets submitted to the Spirit. Yeah. Brother West, I got a little gal in the church. She weighed me down. Somebody came to me and said, Brother Huckabee, there's a lady down here. She hadn't been to church 25 times since I've been a pastor. She's sobbing. I go down. I knew her name. I said, Donette, you all right? She said, Pastor, you ain't going to believe what I'm about to tell you. She opened her hand, and in her hand was two hearing aids. She said, during the preaching this morning, you all said that God can do anything. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. She said, my little girl has never heard a sound without the help of hearing aids. Her little girl, I look down, she's just sobbing. She said she heard your voice for the first time just a minute ago without the help of hearing aids because when the Spirit got to move. <laughs> she said, you said God can do anything. So I just reached over and started snapping the hearing aids out of her ears. Little girl raised her hands, tears running down her face because God did a miracle. <laughs> Because of the Spirit. Woo. If you're in this room and you need a miracle in your home, you need a miracle in your heart, you need a miracle in your mind, the Spirit will lead you into your destiny. <laughs> Lift your hands and open your hearts all over this house. He rondo do bo Come on, sons of God. Ye who are led by the Spirit. If you're in this room, you can be healed tonight. You can be delivered tonight by the work of the Spirit. Somebody in this room, you don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You don't have to leave here dry, parched, and without the blessings and the witness of the Spirit alive and at work in your life. For He is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all you can ask or think. Open your mouth and begin to speak with authority.
That's it, young person. Keep praying right now. Felt the Holy Ghost nudge me. Just keep praying. I'm just going to talk for a minute. I felt the Holy Ghost nudge me. When Brother Huckabee was preaching that there is a strong spirit of anxiety that's attacking the young people of these in this group. I want you to do me a favor. We're going to pray that spirit out of this room right now. So we're going to pray that spirit out of, that, out of this room right now. Some of you have been so debilitated by the trick of the enemy that has paralyzed you into doing nothing from God because you're so scared to make a decision sometimes. And I just believe that the Lord is going to bind that spirit right now. I want you to hear me. If you have that, if you're struggling with the spirit of anxiety, I want you to raise your hand. I don't want, to, don't want you to be embarrassed, but if you're struggling with that spirit, I want you to raise your hand. <laughs> Do me a favor, young people. If you see somebody that's got their hand lifted right now, would you put your hand on their back right now? Pastor Ellis, would you come and pray with us? Would you come and pray for these young people that are struggling with that spirit of anxiety? It's crippling. Go ahead, Pastor. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you today and we stand here on your word today. We don't stand on our opinions. We don't stand on our skills or our experiences, Lord, but our confidence today is in your word. And your word declares that you have not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. And we declare that today. God, you said that we were to stir up the gift of God that's within us. I pray tonight, God, that there would be some young people that would stir up the gift of God that is in them through the laying on of hands. God, you have chosen them. You have selected them. You have anointed them. You have given them, God, what they need to be, who they need to be in this generation. And Lord, I'm praying right now that your hand would rest mighty on them and would stir up the gift that's in them, Lord, so that fear would not reign, anxiety would not reign, intimidation would not reign, shame would not reign, but Lord, lift them now, strengthen them now, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, let them be baptized afresh with your spirit now. Let them be baptized with fire now. In the name of Jesus, you have called us to this time and to this generation for such a time as this. They are exactly who they're supposed to be in you. They are, God, where they're supposed to be. They're in the school that they're supposed to be. They have the personality, God, that you called them to be generation I pray right now that you would loose them in the Holy Ghost loose them in the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus I pray you would break every yoke you would break every lie you would break every chain everything that's holding them back loose them now loose this generation in the name of Jesus Christ would you shout with a voice of triumph? Shout with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah.